the state uh, of uh, Utah passed a law, and in that way they're, they're leading the world. I think that it hasn't been done legally uh, anywhere else. Um, the state of... <laughs> the state of Kelantan in the Federation of Malaysia is leading the world in a different way by actually minting coins, and Zeno Dahindan here uh, talked to us about it, that say government of Kelantan on it and that are sold. So they didn't bother to change the law. They just went ahead and did it and just minted the coins and sell, sold them. And in doing so, they circumvented uh, any opposition. So that's also a model. Now, what do Swiss do? Uh, we don't have the law yet. Uh, it's still being examined in the commission, at the, in the parliament. We don't have the coins yet. Um, the only thing that we do that's special is we're doing it at the federal level. Both Kelantan and Utah are local governments, and Switzerland is the first attempt to do something like this at the federal level, which uh, would be um, obviously uh, qu quite powerful. Now, why would that work? Um, you can imagine there'd be some kind of reticence uh, to do it at the federal level in the US. So why would it work in Switzerland? What's so different? What's so special about Switzerland? Well, what's so special about Switzerland is that little thing called direct democracy, uh, meaning that as long as we collect 100,000 signatures from the people, uh, we don't have to ask permission from anybody. We collect directly from 100,000 people. And then there'll be a referendum. And if the people, 51% of them, uh, say yes, then no matter what the government wants to do, no matter what the parliament wants to do or the central bank wants to do, there will be a gold franc initiated in parallel with the existing Swiss franc. So we can completely circumvent any resistance from the elites by going straight to the people because that's the way Switzerland understands democracy. Now, obviously, that costs a little bit of, a little bit of money. We estimated it costs about $5 million to uh, win this campaign, including collecting the signatures and uh, running the campaign itself. Now, uh, a little back-of-the-envelope calculation that I did was very, very, very conservative. Uh, indicated that should the uh, gold franc be instituted as a parallel currency in Switzerland, uh, that would put upward pressure on the gold price itself, right? Uh, because the gold that is currently being used would have to be minted and it would uh, uh, put pressure on the physical market. Um, it's been, uh, well, I computed it to be about 11%, right? So all we need is to find one Swiss person who has $50 million in gold and go to the proposition, and then hopefully we can get it all done. So it's, it's not that difficult. Um, one thing about the Swiss proposition is that it will be private banks that will mint the coins, because even though the Swiss National Bank still has quite a bit of gold, the Swiss don't want to touch that. They're, they want to protect it. So you know, that, that's, I think, the, the only way to, to introduce parallel uh, gold currency. Now, <clears throat> I. I'm a mainstream academic. I have a pro uh, profession as a researcher at the University of Zurich Economics Department, and my, my career is completely mainstream. So obviously this raises interesting questions for me. What do mainstream economics think about uh, Switzerland and, and other states uh, introducing a parallel currency uh, alongside a fiat currency? Now you can examine that either from the point of view of, of Austrian economics, which we will hear very soon, or, or mainstream economics, and maybe some of you in the audience have this uh, image that all mainstream economics are idiots and that um, they are prejudiced against uh, such initiatives. So I will endeavor to um, maybe bring some good news on that front. Um, now, what happened just after World War II is that uh, economics uh, got physics envy. So they wanted everything to become very mathematical. And in doing so, they made some good progress in certain dimensions, but they also forgot some things that were known for 300 years of economic history before that. And one thing they forgot in 1945, 1947, was what money was. There was no uh, equation for what money is and uh, what's its place. So there was no way to answer questions like, right now, let's introduce gold money. Is it going to work or not? Just the equipment was not there. 
until in 1989, um, two uh, professors named Kiyotaki and Wright invented a so-called search model, which brought money back into mainstream economics with all the required equations and all the physics envy that you want, but at least we could uh, answer these questions properly. And the way they did it is they imagine that I'm endowed with some kind of good. This could be anything, I have, I have a pair of shoes. Okay, I have this pair of shoes. And then I'm gonna meet somebody randomly um, and they're gonna want to exchange something with me. Uh, and maybe they have, they have uh, a, a, an iPhone, okay? All right. So then I meet them and maybe actually I don't want to consume the iPhone. Maybe I want to consume something else like a chair, okay? So what is money is if the iPhone, if I take it not because I want to consume it, but because I expect to exchange it against the chair that I really want, next time I meet somebody else, eventually I'm gonna meet somebody with a chair, right? So then I want to have in my hand when I meet that person with a chair, something that they're gonna want. So if I think that they're gonna want an iPhone, then that iPhone has become money because it's something I take to exchange later, not to consume today. So that's, that's the uh, basic idea. And you can see right there that it's pretty mental, right? It's, it's mental because it's all a game, right? It's a game of expectations. Do I expect that the guy who's got the chair is gonna want the iPhone or not? And he himself is playing games with me, so we have to like all coordinate our games to find a strategy that works. So it's pretty complicated. That's why uh, they become very uh, famous. Uh, this paper was cited by hundreds of uh, subsequent researchers. There are people who do their whole career doing search theory about who exchanges what with whom and find out how money arises. So um, there are a few questions that obviously come to mind when we have uh, the right model to answer, uh, to analyze the, the situation we're in. The first question is, suppose you have uh, fiat money and then you have gold money coexisting with one another. Can they both coexist for a long time, or is one of them eventually gonna eat out the other? Okay. That's important because if we expect that, if, if all mainstream economists know that the day you introduce the first gold coin, fiat currency is doomed, then the amount of resistance you're gonna get politically is gonna be much bigger than if they think that it can coexist forever peacefully. And um, the answer within the Kiyotaki uh, uh, model and right model is that yes, they can coexist forever. Okay? All it takes is for people to believe that they coexist and then they will coexist. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And there's no reason for the bad money to drive out the good or vice versa. Okay, that used to be called Gresham's law. Uh, but there's no reason. They can coexist together very well. So that's first good news uh, from uh, mainstream economics that what we're doing is actually fairly stable. It's not uh, gonna have an earthquake effect. Um, it's gonna be uh, choice in currency going on forever. So that, that's a good thing. Uh, the second thing that we may want to talk about is uh, are people gonna be better off with two currencies than with one? And once again, you take the Kyotaki and uh, Wright model and you make um, the second currency, which in this case is the gold one, you make it easier to trade. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, I can trade gold already. I can go buy uh, some gold you know, in a bank, but it's very hard to trade gold against uh, uh, a pair of shoes or something like that. If you monetize gold, as the bill in Utah is doing, then it's gonna be easier to use gold or some technology, like Marcel's technology, which has gold in it, uh, to, to buy you know, anything that you want. So you're making it easier to use gold as money. And in the model, the implications are extremely clear. Everybody's better off. Everybody's better off because instead of having the choice of just one currency that they can use, they can ha have two. And because choice is better than no choice, that is how you can prove even mathematically that uh, what we're doing by introducing a gold currency uh, makes everybody better off. So that's good. Um, another question is, um, that will be like the third question and the last one because I don't want to inflict too much economic theory upon you. Um, skipping through here. 
Yes, uh, monetary policy. Now you may uh, expect resistance from the central bank if they think that introducing a gold coin in parallel will prevent them from managing the economy. Now obviously some of you don't think they do a very good job at managing the economy, <laughs> but they think they do a good job and they want to continue doing the job that they're doing without being disturbed too much. So is that going to disturb them? And the answer, once again, is uh, no. They can, they can go on. They don't have anything to fear from the gold track. And um, this, is, um, this has been shown in, um, for example, um, when you have very weak currencies. I'm thinking some South American country okay, that's going through some hyperinflation. Uh, Brazil, Argentina, depending on the period. Um, in those countries, the dollar started to be known at the time as a hard currency and started to circulate in parallel with the, um, whatever, the peso or the real or whatever they had over there. Okay? And um, that only happened after the central bank had really, really abused the printing press. Okay? And we can prove mathematically that they have to abuse the printing press a lot before a hard currency becomes a currency of choice for all the people. So they have a lot of margin of error. And besides, in their charter, all the central banks, what they say is they preserve price stability. That's their mission. So the answer from mainstream economics is as long as the central banks do something pretty close to achieving their mission, which is to provide some kind of price stability, and you know, obviously there are issues of how you measure it, whether they fudge the statistics or not, but you know, as long as they're in the ballpark, then the uh, importance of the gold franc will not impinge upon the ability to uh, create boom and bust cycle and whatever else they do. Okay? So I think that there's a message of peace, peace and love here. Uh, <laughs> we, can, we can all work together, uh, mainstream economists and, and uh, Austrians, uh, gold uh, money and uh, paper money. And, um, that I think that sort of reassuring that uh, thanks to this uh, Kyotaki and Wright model of 1989, now we know that we're doing the right thing. Thank you. <laughs>